And we are live on Oz Property Investors. We bring the big names and we have the big fun. And I have to go and hit some buttons to make sure that people can actually see this thing. But I worked it out. How welcome. Are you going anyway, Karina? Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. Welcome, no, you're welcome. Thanks for thanks for joining us on this this fine Wednesday night. And I realize it's only what four Wednesdays or four and a bit weeks before Christmas. So how insane is that? So how how busy how busy are you Karina? Four Wednesdays before Christmas. I oh, maybe it's five actually. Yeah, we've only got a couple. There's only a couple. Today it still is, yeah. counts, right? It still counts. There's still a few hours left of today. Well, five, so. including this one. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what's um, what's happening anyway, Joe? What are you up to? Oh, mate, I'm excited. I'm very excited. I'm I'm having a great day. It's been very very busy. It's inter- look, we got Christmas. Our houses, if you can see behind me, we now have Christmas stuff everywhere. Um, my wife is a big Christmas fan, and uh, we are now celebrating before December 1st, which I feel like is a little bit of sacrilegious, but um, there's some okay. cheer around. There's cheer floating about this place, which is what I like. How are you, Jeff? I'm, I'm good. I'm just, I, I thought I could, oh, uh, no, this is not going to, I'm going to have to figure this thing out. I, I know how it works, but I just, I, I tested this morning. No, I tested it. I'm going well. I'm going well. Really well, actually. No, it's, You're well. I, I tested her. Okay. Yeah. We, but let's, we had some technical difficulties last week. We, we went um, to a private group. And um, Jeff is still struggling with working out how to go live. So we are live, but uh, we have no visit, no watches. So people on YouTube are going to be like, come on, guys, get into it. But uh, there's no one actually on the audience. Um, but no, t- but t- anyway. tonight's, tonight's going to be tonight's going to be an amazing session because we often uh, there's there's people that sort of say that is it too late to sort of get started investing and, and what um, what do I need to sort of factors that I need to consider? And everybody gets sort of caught up and says, oh, you know, I've missed the property boats and and all those sort of nice uh, analogies and metaphors. But you don't have to be concerned. It's not all doom and gloom. It's not easy or it's not as as easy. Look, I would have loved to have bought property at sort of 18, 19, Joe, but I bought my first at 25. Uh, I think you you probably touched younger than me, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not not sure. Um, I'm trying to go live, not, but I can't. No, no, that's no, okay. I, I, I've got it. You, you, we just keep talking. I, I know, I know. I've, I've got this sort of man. Quote of the week. No, content of the week. Karina, what, what have you been yes. digging around? What's your content of the week that you've been enjoying? So, lots of conflicting priorities in business. Love doing business. Getting busy in business, and uh, like still it. like to double on whatever's going on out there. Uh, but don't want to overload myself too much. So my time to kind of get into a lot of other content can be limited when I'm having so much fun in the business. Uh, So I've been reading over the last couple of months um, Marcus Aurelius Meditations. Pretty um, interesting type of read where you can read a paragraph, read a couple of lines, read one meditation and uh, ponder. Yes. Take some time to ponder. So um, one of the ones that I thought uh, that actually is quite fitting for what we're going to be talking about today is um, many grains of incense fell on the same altar, one sooner, another later. It makes no difference. So lots of I oh. read a lot of comments about leading up to uh, today's conversation and uh the trend is there's always opportunities there. So you started when you're 18, someone starts when they're 48. One mm-hmm. sooner, one later. So, yeah, That's sometimes good. you just got to ponder the bigger things in life. <laughs> yeah, I like it. That is very that is very well timed and and property orientated. What are some Have you got any other favorite quotes from the book? So that book, I I picked it up myself, I don't know, a few years ago. And exactly, I, I read the story and I got through like the first chapter where someone English wrote it and is not a, you know, BC Greek, 3 Correct. billion BC Greek yes. guy. And then I got to where he starts and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm struggling here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, some of the interpretations, um, I mean, any kind of poetry is uh, whatever, the like behold of the reader type thing. Um, mm. There was another one that was about like, um comrades falling in the battlefield so like you've got your own duty um to play uh, but how much easier is it when you've got someone beside you to pick you up if you're injured and take you forward so kind of plays on that um 
when they're not all lone soldiers, surround yourself with uh, people who can help. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in property. Um, that's the biggest thing. I think there's so many team members that I think that's one thing you have to get over. It's like, you're not going to do all this by yourself. You're not going to, well, you can definitely do it by yourself. Don't get me wrong, but it's the smartest people I know uh, have a good team of good people that are experts in their field. Cause otherwise you have to become an expert in accounting, broking, buying, finding, <laughs> negotiating. Like it, it gets, it gets a lot. Um, yeah, I like you're that. Also, um, um, you're also kind of biased by your own opinions and experiences. So if you're just asking yourself for advice all the time and leading yourself, well, there's only so much like you can experience to be able to or time that you've got available to, uh, you know, go hunting for a property or um, do an accounting degree type of thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't have time for an accounting degree. Not not this week, at least. <laughs> not this week. Um, <clears throat> what about you, Jeff? What's your uh, content of the week, mate? So my my content of the week is um is by you, you might have seen seen this guy. So he's a he's a pretty good mate of Steve Ignite. So his name is Brendan Nichols. Um, so he he's he's yeah. um he's famous. He, he's kind of done a, a number of books, and his one of his books is um is escaping. I think it's called. I'm trying to remember what it's called, but it's 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 a it's a fantastic book. Given I can't remember the name of it, but but no, it's a it's a, it's a great it's a great book. Yeah, no, it, it it is a good book, but um, I'm just trying to remember. Uh, see, I'll, I'll look it up now. I'll tell you what it is. So, okay, what's the, the, the why, I, why is it good? <laughs> um, so the thing the thing I love thing I love about this book is he, uh, it's called the way out. There you go. That's what it is. It's it's just yeah. So he he talks about sort of because this guy, he, he, I don't know if you've seen him speak, Brennan, uh, for Joe, but um, he sort of, he literally sort of was was broke and had this. He he talks about the snap point, um, which is where you sort of you get to the stage where you where you can't sort of where things can't get any not not they can't get worse, but unlikely to, and and it's sort of like a breakthrough moment. So a lot of people talk about the breakthrough moment, but he was he's very compelling in this sort of story, and he actually unpacks and he sort of says. He, he talks around the psychology around it and 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 creates a step by step process of how to um, make as much money as you want to um, and escape the grind as he sort of speaks. So I think it's a really fantastic book. It's it's called The Way Out, Out. and um, yeah, it's sort of is a little bit uh, metaphysical. So you need to sort of it's not as not as deep as a, as the secret is for those people that read the secret, but um, yeah, it sort of does have some more practical frameworks to look at. But it is. It is not your sort of straight business book, but um, yeah, that's that's my content of the week, the way out, and I've I've been reading that for for a little bit now, so that's that's what I got. Yeah, what do you got, Joe? Okay, okay, um, I, I I consume some content, but not a lot of content. Um, the, the most recent one is just the Open AI saga. Have you guys have you guys oh, heard yeah. about this? <laughs> Sam have you heard about Altman. Have He's you heard back. About this, no, no. Is he back? I haven't. I haven't been following it up. Yeah, I, read yeah, it I, don't, I just heard over the friends, over the weekend. In the chat. I mean, but I don't for know. people that are going to come back anyway, it's like Steve Jobs, mate. Like he's, he's, he's always he's coming like, back. You can't you can't separate <laughs> like open AIs. He's like the he's the Steve Jobs of of chat of open AI. Of open AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So essentially, the content is. Um, this guy, Sam Altman, one of the smartest people in the world, the new um, uh, the new Bill Gates is what they're calling him. He uh, on Friday got fired from OpenAI, the largest you know AI company in the world, and is worth ninety billion dollars. And randomly, he gets fired. So he's like, okay, I'm fired. Now what do I do? Um, so everyone was like, oh my gosh, he's doing all this bad stuff. He must be a bad bad man. But then his co-founder was like, this is this is B. And then the uh, the board said. No, this is um, we're firing him because he did something. He he hasn't been communicating with us clearly. And then the CEO is like, uh, the co-founder is like, cool, I quit as well. And then what happened is over the the weekend, every single employee, nine hundred employees of uh, OpenAI, signed a petition that they're all leaving OpenAI to go join whatever that guy's joining. Um, so it's been a very interesting uh, interesting saga uh, going forward. But um, it was that's well it was worth mutiny. Mutiny. Uh -huh. 
Absolute that mutant. That is pretty cool. I think that's a really great demonstration of a leader or like a, a genius that you say, I'll follow you wherever you go. It's okay if your communication is not great. You can have other people who communicate for you. But if you, 100%. you know, yeah, that's quite 100%. interesting. Yeah. So welcome everyone who's just joined the live. We have some technical difficulties, so sorry about that. But tonight we are going to be running a live session with the amazing Karina Fox. Um, we are going to, Jeff, what are we talking about? What is the, what's the show today that these people should be enjoying? So uh, we're going to be talking about have, have you missed the property investing boat? But what does that actually mean? Because that can mean many different things to many people. But what it means uh, in this context, so Karina is a broker. So she's a strategic mortgage broker. Strategic mortgage, uh, uh, it's not quite the company that I, I didn't quite nail that. But the, so first off, we're going to talk about the things you need to absolutely nail for the bank to approve your loan because it's great to sort of um, so get your loan approved, but what sort of if you're going to borrow a million dollars, what are the what are some of the core key things you need to look at? And then we're actually going to jump into what the property investing like being too late to the party. So like, what are the things that are going to stop you if you're sort of in your in your late thirties or look even if you're in your late twenties? Because some people think, oh, you know, I've missed the boat, or we'll sort of talk to some of those things. Karina will give us her sort of first world ex not first world her first hand experiences. And then we'll talk about how to overcome those challenges that people in the various stages of, of their life cycle um, are facing. Because yeah, some, this is not a sort of thing a lot of people talk about. And then we'll get, we'll we'll pack to some examples as well. So I think it's going to be going to be packed packed with a lot of um, content and just absolutely valuable. Because if you can't get a loan approved, unless you've got a wealthy uncle or auntie who's going to spot you on an investment property, which is probably not going to happen for most of us, um, you need yeah. to sort of partner with a bank. So what are the sort of steps you need to take if you're a bit later in the game to, to make sure yeah. that you're ticking all their boxes? Yeah, and that's the biggest thing. I think for every single age bracket, be your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, they all have pros and they all have cons as to why you should be buying a property at this point in time. And at what point it's a bit too late to be considering um, a type of deal because what you're buying in your 20s is absolutely not what you're buying in your 70s and your 60s it is going to have to be a different a different beast but what does it actually look like and how do we overcome the challenges that we get with the broking space to be able to um actually actually get there so i i am uh, i'm excited for this one i think we're gonna have a a good show on our hands but just before we do that just remember all of this is not financial advice um and read through this little just dis disclaimer here yeah Cop City. Okay, let's uh, let's before we do that, let's introduce the amazing Karina after this little. Thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special announcement from the master of commercial property investing, Steve Polisi. I love commercial property. Get ready to have your minds blown as Steve is back, and he's got some pretty exciting news for us. Steve is unleashing his second sensational book upon the world, and get this: for the Oz Property Investors members out there, he's giving it away absolutely free. Mm -hmm. Yep. 100% free. Yep, 100% free for all property enthusiasts who want to learn and grow on their commercial property investing journey. But he's also added a little extra chili to make this deal even spicier. With this free book, you'll also receive a complimentary one hour strategy session with the man himself. Imagine a full 60 minutes with Steve's commercial and property genius dedicated to helping you master the intricate dance of commercial property investing. And who better to dance with the man who looks better than Patrick Swayze in Dirty Dancing? I don't know about that. Want to grab this offer? It's super easy. If you're live right now, click the link in the comments and secure it today. If not, grab your device, open up the browser, head over to policyproperty.com, look for the book page and grab your free copy of Steve's latest masterpiece. And when you're checking out, make sure to use the exclusive code OZPROP to secure the free book and also your free one hour strategy session. My only concern with this offer is that Steve's going to have to turn it off soon as he can only do so many sessions. So if you want to secure your spot, do so today. Oh, nearly passed out there. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't get old, that one. So if, if you're um, look, if you're facing challenges with your sort of investing and getting loans approved, we want to hear those questions. So what do you want? Even if it's just general broking, we'll, we will, if we have time, we'll get to as much of that because... I think Karina has an absolute wealth of knowledge. So who is this? Uh, who's the woman of the hour, the, the, the person, or maybe two hours, depending on how long we want to chat for. 
But you, you have, you, Karina, have extensive experience in, in finance, broking, and HR. So a, an absolutely amazing combination, a, a, a critical combination there of, of skills because in, in HR, I think communication is, is absolutely vital. So I think you, you bring that in your sort of passion and commitment to that you sort of had there. You're now sort of helping people to get to to shape their financial futures. So, and and I think you you sort of focus on first time buyers, investors, and SMSF and women. So I think it's it's great that you you're helping people make those decisions. But I think I also find find interesting about yourself. You do have a, a personality and and a life outside <laughs> of finance and and money. I am you, a you real are, person. Yeah, you are. You are. You're an aerial yes. yoga instructor, the flexible mortgage broker. So yes, um, yeah. you're a yoga instructor. So aerial, uh, yoga. aerial, aerial, aerial yoga. Aerial. Oh Jesus! Let's yeah. up the stakes. Let's get in the air. Hanging Sounds upside scary, down, like, spinning I'm around. A intimidated by that. Look at it? uh, it's a different world upside down. Definitely, <laughs> <laughs> nothing to right um keep you keep you fit. Have a bit of fun. Keep you sane. Yeah, I, I, that's I, all we can ask for. Exactly, exactly. So the other thing I love about it is you give back as well. You sort of raise some money for, and that's something I need to do a bit more as well. So good, good on you, Karina. And and you are a, a partner of, of strategic mortgage mortgage brokers. Recently re, rebranded from Diagnostics yes. and Finance. Can we, can we use that word? Diagnostic? Or we not? It's not DNF. We're not Previously about known DNF. as. That's right. Yeah. Whenever yes. I think of the, I, I just think of um, the artist formerly known as the, on The Sims. You know, I'm. That's that's um. Trying to think that that guy changed his name, um, Kent McClure, I think it was. I don't know, maybe I don't know somebody Brian else. But anyway, yeah. So, Karina, the question we love asking people um, most most of the times is, tell us about what got you into property. What was your first investing experience? So, my first dive into investing was helping hundreds of other people do it. Mm. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and realize, hey, there's something going on here. Now, um, I swore that I would never do a construction loan. We do them. We do lots of them. They can be extremely stressful. They take a long time. So I, uh, I swore off construction uh, and mm-hmm. then I did it myself. <laughs> so, uh, that yeah, that was that my, my first dive. First intro. Was this for a PPOR for, or for an investment? For an investment. Uh, yeah. so I did a, a jewel lock, um, found an agent that was just a gun that I'd worked with, seen some pretty cool things happen. Um, they're super efficient, do a lot of research into the market. I do this full time. Mm-hmm. So why not, uh, use the skills and resources of someone else who does it full time. I don't need to be an expert in that space. I just need to know that I, I like them, I trust them, see good results and so far so good. There you go. I, I think that's that's absolutely that's absolutely critical because you are an expert in, in your sort of you're you're a finance um, expert and extraordinaire I would say. And and I'm I'm probably having sort of been in that, and it's kind of like even people trying to do their own tax to save themselves three or five hundred or a thousand bucks, whatever it is, and they just end up burning through so much time. And I just think, what could you have done with that extra ten to fifteen or twenty hours, and what result could you have achieved um, on your on your taxes, or your finance? So good Absolutely. on you for recognising that. Karina. It's all different skills though, as well. Like in property, there are just so many different skills that you need to be able to be great at everything. And there is absolute, like, there are jobs out there that I would never do. And mortgage broking is, I just, I'll, I'll find, negotiate and secure deals till the cows come home. But there's no way I could find, negotiate and secure a mortgage for somebody. Like the loan structure and all the different banks and all the different policies. And then this week, this bank wants this. Oh, no, that was last week's policy. This changed. And then you yeah. got to keep in. It's so damn confusing. And I guess that's the biggest value that I see for a mortgage broker is, all day, every day, they deal with loans and they have 45, 50 people on their panel and then they know the pros and cons for everything and then they find you as a little square peg and here you are trying to put yourself in a round hole, doesn't work, great, here's a square peg. Here are the, the five square pegs. Let's go for one of these ones that stacks up. Perfect. Absolutely. And it's the best best deal. It doesn't necessarily need to be the best rate. I think that's where a lot of people get a bit stuck in, in broking is like, hey, 
this person has five, you know, 5.9% and this one's 6.2. Well, the 6.2 gives you the offset, allows you flexibility and all that good stuff. Maybe you're better off as an investor going 6.2. Yeah, it's definitely purpose-driven and project-driven. I think, you know, when you're juggling multiple projects and you get to see each project have a, a success, like loan settling, people kicking goals, um, I think it's uh, it makes it worth the, the stress and anxiety that comes with the very changing environment that is the lending landscape. It's good it fun. We like to have a bit of fun. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Great. So, should we should we talk about? We're twenty minutes in. So, well, we let, let's let's crack into. So, I'm a I'm sort of about to go and apply for a loan, <laughs> and let's just say I've I've sort of decided to do other things in my my journey. I, I've decided not to buy property and all that sort of thing. But I've now decided now is the time. I'm, I'm going to go and go and get involved. So, what are the what are the key considerations that people should be looking at when they're to make sure they're getting they're giving themselves the best opportunity to get their loan approved. So what are the key aspects of it? Um, Five seasons, so to speak. Let's say uh, first and foremost, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. So <laughs> like, get yourself organized, get your ducks lined up, talk to people, be prepared. Look, we, um, it's not uncommon for a contract of sale to hit our desk with someone who hasn't prepared themselves for finance. Uh, but I tell you, if you can prepare yourself for it, you're going to make the process a whole lot easier for yourself. I do it day in, day out. So the stress and pressure is fine. It's manageable. Uh, but I think for yourself, if you're, um, if you're wanting to get in, get yourself prepared for it. So uh, you mentioned the five C's. Uh, we're all here on a boat, so uh, I, uh, I'm i going to mm. maybe talk about seven Cs to be uh, fitting with the image you guys pulled up. <laughs> so okay. I, I think uh, character is the first one. So um, mm. who you are, mm. what you do, um, what your credit history is like, that's, a, that's one that has probably come to a forefront over the last couple of months with all the um, data breaches that, you know, Telstra, AHM, all of those um, have had where people are becoming a little bit more aware of their credit files and uh, what their activity has been. But yeah, understanding what your um, your credit score is, what your uh, conduct in, on your existing facilities have been. Um, we do a complimentary credit report as part of our process. It's mandatory. Uh, if you're working with a broker and then not doing a check on your CCR, on your comprehensive credit report before you go for finance, then make sure, hit them up to, to do it. You can do it yourself free online. Uh, but understanding that the things that you do actually have an impact. So another um, interesting thing, we had one of our BDMs, business development <clears throat> uh, managers from the banks come in. I look at them as the champion between me and the lender, so when I'm championing you, they're championing me, um, that they actually said to us their credit teams are now Google searching people and uh, looking you up online and seeing what they can find about you. So, you know, you might have a, a score that stacks up, but, uh, you know. How deep do they go? Like, how, like you? you say that they yeah. do tests, like they look at your online profile. Like how, what, what does that actually mean? So it's just um, ultimately when you're when you're putting an application through the system, there's a whole lot of information that you're providing. So uh, who you are, where you live, um, where you work, how long you've lived and worked there, what your full asset liability position is, what your conduct is, how much you spend. Like they they want everything. They want blood. They want your firstborn child, and you have to declare that and say it's true, accurate. This is who you are. Um, I think where like some lenders will actually do employment checks, they will call your employer to check and verify. Um, oh, wow. They're looking at uh, at your pay slips, at the employer's ABN to verify that it's a legitimate business. Is the employer um, where you're uh, working, do they have a registered website? Like if they can't find the employer, um, RP data, you know, looking at, 
at property. Um, if you say you live in a place and you're you're renting or like those things are visible now um, depending on platform accessibility and subscriptions and those type of things, but they do dive in. Yeah, okay, okay. So they don't go into your Facebook profile and go that deep, do they? Mate, if your Facebook profile is private, they, def they know, definitely do. They definitely bit... can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because because what what could happen is, imagine if you're saying you're single, but you know you got you got yourself with uh, oh, with your, with your nearest yes, and dearest. I, and what's, what's yeah, so there? I've actually I've seen that that happen. So it didn't quite um, hit the lender because we actually do a search of people. So. Um, you know, declaring that they're single and you don't have to be able to have an open profile. Like if you've got your profile picture is you and your wife and your kid <laughs> in the picture, it's pretty hard to say that you're a single applicant. It's for, yeah. your, for your profile, I'm not, I'm not suggesting people um, um, change or be dishonest, but you can have a, a, pro, a photo of a, a soccer ball. As a, I mean, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> kind of fun and and, and yeah what, what, what yeah that's that's very generic but yeah yeah anyway. i think something to uh, to think about is um there's a reason why you're going for finance and the implications of you providing incorrect information like you're the only one that's going to get hurt by it yeah because you're the one that's taking the, on the mortgage you're signing the contract to say this is my responsibility now bank i will pay you back and i can do it and um yeah. you know i yeah. think the onus that's is good, on you. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah, because the banks already put a large buffer on deals. Like Absolutely. if you're going with a, yes. I, I mean, third, if you're with a third tier lender and a third tier lender kicks you back and says, no, I'm not going to lend to you, you might want to say, hey, that's might be like a first tier. I would definitely go to the second and third and check that out. But a yeah. third tier, if they're saying no, I'd be like, hmm, maybe I need to reassess my situation. <laughs> they do put buffers on though. Absolutely. So that's actually another one is um, the uh, like conditions are, you know, purpose of the loan, how much money you need, what the rates are, um, does it suit the objective? Mm -hmm. So when you're presenting your loan, it's got to make sense. It's got to stack up. Um, and the other part to that is the capacity. So that's the one of the third C's is um what like lenders are putting assessment rates on so you know interest rates are six and a half percent they're assessing you at nine and a half percent they're actually looking at um can you afford it as it is now yes but obviously uh anyone who's got a mortgage knows we've been in an increasing interest rate environment so um you know what's the impact on on those things and they're putting other buffers in place as well like you know you can your base salary, you're working PAYG, um, earning good coin, 100% of that income they're going to use. You earn double your income, double your base in commission. They want to see that it's consistent. So they're going to be looking for two years of evidence of those type of things or bonus two years. Um, so they're looking for consistency and then they're looking at things where you have some variability in your income. They're going to shave like 20% off it and say, well, you get it, and that's awesome. Uh, however, we don't want to rely on something that can vary. Yeah, yeah. I used to, uh, I was in a sales environment, and I got a small salary but large commissions, and they, I think it, they didn't count the commissions as a, as a part of the salary. Um, so it made buying, it actually made me change the company that I worked for so that I could get a higher yeah. salary and less commissions. Um, yeah, because I wasn't able to do that. It's interesting. Like it's an interesting space uh, because, you know, being a broker, when you've got so many products available to you, it's all purpose driven. So mm. I could, you know, brand that majority of lenders will shave off, <laughs> but there are lenders that within their policy will allow you to use a hundred percent of it. Um, what you've got to weigh up and assess is is if someone's going to change and be a little bit outside the norm policy, there's something else that's changing. So you might be paying a slightly higher interest rate or a 
higher application fee to be able to source that type of lending. So there's always options out there. It's just got to be based on, you know, suitable to what your goal is that you're looking to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. The, what was the that, what was that you just brought I, up, um, Jeff? Sorry, man. Oh, yeah. I was just saying that um, the, the the lender, a great final check on your situation, the valuation says you're, you're not up to scratch. Assuming they have correct information, then there's usually a good reason. Um, so sort of, Talk, talking to talking to people about yeah. well they're, they're like the gate they're the gatekeeper because ultimately the bank is uh, the, the lender is is giving you sort of 80 they're your business partner so they're lending you mm. sort of 70 80 85 sometimes up to 95 percent of the worth of, of the value of the property so you're going to think well if they're if they're comfortable sort of signing off on, on giving you that money then they're, they're probably making they're doing their checks they're dotting their eyes and they're crossing their t's um but, but the thing you pointed to there is about the, the higher rate loans is often there's, there's the third tier ones. They're, they're, I don't know if you call them this, but these, they're sort of called situation lenders um, or circumstance lenders or whatever, where you sort of, you, you go with those for one to two years and you pay that higher rate. And and do you sort of see people then transition back to once their circumstances improve or their income or whatever reason they're with that yeah. lender? Absolutely. If you've if you've gone to a special purpose lender, it's a vehicle for you to achieve something at that time based on your circumstances at that time. So the beauty of life is that things change, circumstances change, CCR report, maybe some default or misconduct that you had. Maybe you had a maybe you were self-employed and you've business went to shit and then you you know went okay this isn't for me I'm going back into payg land where I can have some you know reliability on my my income and I've got some rubbish I need to clean up from business and you're affected by that now and uh, that's not going to be hanging around forever but you've committed to buying a family home or you're needing to consolidate or recycle some debt that you've accumulated to put yourself into a better position it's based on a purpose so those lenders are generally purpose driven and i think if you're sitting in a loan like that um have a think about why that was your strategy at the time what was the purpose behind it and have your circumstances changed that might be able to put you in a position now where you can go to a major a t1 t2 type lender um and can like the other flip side of that is uh, and I love this because I love anyone who kind of gets into, you know, owning and running business is you've been hustling, P-A-Y-G, working hard. And then you say, look, I've got the skill set now. I can do this. I want to do it myself. Those are also people who get affected by their circumstance where a major who's wanting two year full financials and, you know, 24 month ABN registration doesn't want to touch you. Or yeah, you know. So it's kind of um, they're they're well, purpose is, driven. This is what um one of the users came, one of the members came up with. How about lending for small businesses that have only just started? I mean, kind of let's it's, answer that question. DJ. But also, what are the what are the general? How, how should we think about business lending? Like lending for small businesses. Like how should we generally think about it? Because I've heard. You need two years worth of financials, and you need, and then other lenders are like, "I need just one year." Others are like, "Yeah, what what is the general rule? How does it kind of work? How should we think about it?" I would say you're looking at um, the lending requirements, maybe, uh, or per, what's permitted might be a little bit tighter. So they may not lend you up to ninety five percent; they might restrict you to lending sub eighty. Uh, okay. Yeah, if you go for the path of least resistance, you're looking at, you know, two-year full financials, as I mentioned, 24-month ABN registration, GST registered if you're a company, that type of stuff. They want everything. They want to see it all. If you're bringing it back, there's lenders that will do, like, one-day ABN registration, you know. But really? they're Yeah, so look there, you know, without going that? into that too much, it's it's – it's the coming coming back to character. And you know that, Joe. Man, there's, they're it's out like, there, man. They're, it's, I think it's only no. I think it's only broker lenders, though. Like you, not broker. There, you can only go through them for not a, necessarily for a accessible to the direct consumer. That's right. But if you think about um, the what your character is, right? So if you've changed from a completely different industry, so you've been a chef 
and now you're going into, I don't know, marketing. Mortgage broking. <laughs> mortgage broking. And you've got no prior education in it, no skill set. The, like the industry experience is, that is not there. It's really hard to tell the bank that you're going to be legit for the money to repay that mortgage. So I think if, you know, bringing it back to um, like your character, what the story is, what your purpose is behind it, um, and then also recognising that don't put your life on hold just for the sake of like your your finance journey. Like if you have been a chef and you really want to become a mortgage broker, you'll be working long hours, but you've been working long hours as a chef anyway. But it's kind of <laughs> saying like you don't want to miss out, you know, on on an opportunity if it's your passion or where you know where your interest lies and maybe your um your lending is going to be a bit tighter and more difficult to obtain or it's going to be more expensive because they're going to hit you with a an interest rate that's you know over seven percent but if it's going to assist you for a time then it might actually work for you yeah, 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 love that. That's yeah. that's really kind of it's it's only for it's not for hopefully it's not for thirty years. It's it's kind of for for a year or two or whatever it is, and until you sort of get yourself established and entrenched in that kind of in that line of work. Um, I want to sort of switch tax a little bit because I want to we've we've skirted around this assessment rate issue, not issue, but assessment rate. I, I want to sort of get your. You may not have. I mean, I think you're probably seeing it day in day out. You, maybe not. What are your thoughts on, are they going to reduce that sort of assessment? They have started, some lenders have taken it back to 2.5 from my understanding. But do you think that as a whole, the lenders will sort of come back from 3% to, to 2% or is that too, <coughs> too big me. of a question for you to answer? What are your thoughts on um, that? So I want to borrow more money. <laughs> so if you think about banks as, in, as businesses, banks make money from lending mortgages so they take that. those mortgages they go and invest them so if you look at it from that scale then they want to keep their business going so they're going to find ways that they can still assist and um and continue to lend to people so a few things that um we've seen come out are simple self-employed verification so you know if you're um a company paying yourself uh, a wage consistent you can evidence it you can service a uh, service sorry um, service your mortgage there's a blend in words for you if you can Herbage. service your mortgage <laughs> off that your um, term? <laughs> oh mate oh mate it's 7 30 i've been up since 4 30 so come on <laughs> um for yoga eat your heart yeah. every day <laughs> every day so if you can like if you can service you qualify um as long as your business is running profitably then we can exclude anything that's sitting in the business so these this is something that wasn't out a couple of years ago or um looking at one year we had a few lenders that would do one year financials we've seen a few more lenders come out with that we've seen lenders uh, with a one percent buffer instead of the three oh, wow. percent, and those are things yeah. like, you know, we we're we've been in this environment where you know people are are struggling. You know, they haven't planned for it. They've been enjoying the low rate ride, and not really recognizing that these things are not lasting forever. <laughs> There's a reason why the lenders, you know, um, drop their rates so low, but. Um, you know, there's this this term about mortgage prison and being stuck with the lender that you're in. But if you're mm. making your mortgage repayments, you're committed, your conduct is great. There's actually lenders that are out there that you may not qualify to service a standard loan, but you could be in one of those special vehicles, special purpose type of loans that we spoke about before, that your circumstances have changed, but the rates have just and the servicing rates have just kind of run away from you. But if you can demonstrate good conduct, then there are options to kind of uh, get you out of that space. And not every lender is doing it, and they don't advertise it either. So talk to it's, a broker. And, and what, what, what they'll do, from my understanding, is they'll do, they'll do a dollar for dollar refinance. So they, they won't. Let's just say you got a let's just say you got a property worth a million dollars and you got five hundred k debt on it. They're not going to say, yeah. okay, you can come across to us and we'll give you we'll give you a seven hundred k loan. 
they'll yeah. they'll say yeah. okay you you're paying nine percent and you can't you can't sort of service that even if we yeah. give you a rate of six percent it's kind of a common sense approach to say well you're paying nine percent you've been paying that we'll yeah. we'll we'll bring you across and you can probably easily afford that six percent we can give you but we won't That's give right. you that two hundred k cash out there. Yeah, no, it's not for uh, it's not for the keen investors out there. It's for the it's for those that are, um, you know, find themselves, you know, they've been in a bind and looking for what can better their situation to eventually be able to, you know, achieve the next goal of, uh, you know, investing or yeah. accessing equity or whatnot. <laughs> I think that that works out quite quite nicely, and that, that'll well, let's let's start talking about the having missed the property investing boat because I think a lot oh. of people will have that sort of mindset. They'll just say, "Oh, it's it's I can't do anything at the moment," and and those people that have dollar for dollar refinance, they might say, "Oh, look, what am I achieving? I'm just I'm not able to go and buy that first investment property or that second investment property That's now." Right. But that is that is a stepping stone to them be able to then look open up you open up to to other lenders once you if you can sort of demonstrate so. Let's. Um, I'm going to ask the the first question. So, what what are some what are some tips um, you have for for older or sort of customers or even people sort of in their late thirties or early forties? Oh what, yeah, what that, no. That, that, I think I think where's worthwhile starting is rather than breaking it down like that. Let's go through the age range, right? Let's okay. Let's uh, like the 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 twenties, the thirties, the forties, fifties, uh, and sixties. I think that would lend us to a little bit more so you can so people in the audience can bundle themselves into a little bit of a when, bit of a bracket yeah. <laughs> um would that, would that get just, people's uh, interest perhaps i mean yeah perhaps but i guess uh, like i guess the the like let's just start at the 20s right we'll just breeze breeze through the 20s why are we breezing through the 20s because you're going to be fine mr 20 year old you have Time on your side. Time. You're absolutely. 18. What about eighteen? Don't worry about twenty. I, I, I saw teens. so many we'll people bring on them teens. Up saying, "When did you yeah. buy your first? What age were you when you first bought your first? And the amount of people I saw that said 18, 19, I was like, "That's amazing! Wow. Like, how good? How good yeah. is it that we have a community of people do that?" But twenty. Okay. 20s, okay. What, what okay. Like early, early, uh, late teens, early twenties, <laughs> late twenties, and all twenties. What are I some of the things that. we need to think about? <laughs> I liked that you said you've got time on your hands because I think, you know, uh, you can often um, be worried about what other people are doing around you. You're missing out. That that kind of mentality can be at any stage of your life. And I think when you recognise that you've got a whole lot more time on your hands, you've got the opportunity to um, take a few risks mm -hmm. when you're younger um then the you know the other end um i think some of the restrictions or um constraints your income uh wow. often you know you're either um just starting your career or not knowing what your career is uh you might have um i think uh, it's like you can have 14 to 16 different jobs in your lifetime which is about six different career changes so oh. recognizing that your employment you might be with one employer for two to three years and then change so understanding that your your income will vary you will start to earn more money you gain experience you invest in your education um looking at uh i saw some stats around uh over I think it was also a similar thing around the last 30 years. There's been like a 30% increase in people actually getting higher education, and which is awesome because it means your ability to earn more money um, as you gain more experience over time increases. Uh, the other side to that is you get these wonderful things called hex debts. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, I think... With anything, when you obtain any kind of lending, there's a, a purpose behind it for you to pay it off. So it is a vehicle for you for an education to be able to put yourself forward um, and not to think that, oh, it comes out of my salary, it's going to be no problem, um, I don't really see it. Uh, it actually does and can long-term impact your borrowing 
because it's a and they, they, they charge the interest on hex as well don't they like what what, what they they change that as well like it doesn't it's not just a set interest rate so it's kind of like a home loan. it went up like 7.6 percent i think it was going up like one one percent 1.5 and then they they hit people with like a seven percent rise or something and um yeah i spoke to a client and it was just oh i was making repayments down you know paying off my my hex debt and then I just got hit with an extra couple of thousand dollars. So it is one of those things that people do uh, forget about it as they go through. And it's, I'm talking now like you're in your 30s and you're not really, you're working full time, that type of thing. Um, but mm. having a, a strategy to see, okay, well, what impact does it have on your borrowing and what can you do to eliminate it, clear it? You get a, you know, there's different strategies. I'm not going to provide any advice around which one is best, but it really is understanding what your options are and understanding what impact that it it does have when those things hang around. So one of the questions I have for the 20-year-olds is, do I need to build up credit history by getting a credit card as a kid? When I turned, So when I turned 18, um, I got an email from the Commonwealth Bank, a piece of mail, actually, they physically mailed it to me and they said, congratulations, yeah. Joe, you're 18. You can now get a credit card. Mm. I was like, but weren't you just Dolomite? Wasn't I just a Dolomite kid two <laughs> minutes ago? Now you've got me hooked on a credit card? And I was actually yeah. scared of the scared of the mail. I threw it out and I was like, hey, I'm not getting involved with that. But they you said- You weren't really you know, scared of the mail, were you, Joe? Are you actually- Build credit. I'm, I'm, I was scared of debt at the time. Um, okay. But- I always see this thing. It's like a US USA base. You hear it in the movies all the time. I'm going to get a credit card to build up credit. Is that a thing in Australia? Is that something that we should be thinking about? Is that something we should be doing as a 20 year old? What What are your thoughts? I think uh, we are. Australia is very heavily influenced by American like culture, pop culture, a lot of movies, Hollywood. Uh, I have a client who has never had a credit card. Um, no buy now pay later no phone bill he he does a um, monthly prepaid has lived at home with his family so he had zero uh credit score credit file and he was able to get finance so i think this is where the bigger picture comes in is it's not just based on your credit score what are the other parts and what are the other components going back to those C's is what's his character? What kind of collateral does he have? What's his contribution going in? What are the other things that are building up the profile of this person? And what, 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 what capacity as well, because like, do they sort of wait certain ones? I mean, I don't think they do. Did, they wouldn't put a yeah. waiting. It do, does getting a credit card help you borrow? No, the answer is no. No. Isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. No. <laughs> don't do it, kids. Yeah. Don't get a credit card, please. Yeah. Well, it really is. is. Make, make, yeah. This is yeah. not financial advice. advice. You, 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 no, you you're not, I don't have a credit card at the moment. I got rid of mine, but yeah. Yeah, and the, and it's also weighing up. Like uh, you're you're young. You want to have a good time. Your mates are all going to Europe. You're gonna or you know do a a whole one month drive through the east coast to the west coast of America or something fun, yeah. and um, you've got the uh, the old personal loan unsecured personal loan to to fund it what's the opportunity cost that you've had there like if you didn't get it and you didn't have the savings then you wouldn't have had that holiday and experience and growth that you have there so whether you do it or not whether you save for it or not I think it's understanding that anytime you get credit it will affect you in in some capacity and the whole idea of of it is if you get it you got to pay it off yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, credit cards, right. yeah. you max out the credit card limit, you go on a shopping spree, that's how the bank is assessing you. They're not assessing that you have brilliant conduct and you you only use it for a few online purchases and you pay it off at the end of the month. They yeah. don't assess it like that's that. It. They say, yeah, you've been a little... It's a 10,000 max. Fun. You have to pay 10,000. Like it's, it is it is at that number. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, 20 and 30. I think those two ages are probably good to be bundled together. Like, right. oh. does, does does any any thirty and forty year old feel any different? I don't know. I'm I'm early thirty, so I just feel that way. I feel forty. 
But is there much of a difference? So maybe we just bundle those together because I think there's going to be a lot of learnings along the way. And we're getting a lot of questions from people in 50s and <laughs> 40s and 50s that are interested <laughs> to learn. So, They're like, hurry up. Let's get to the good yeah, part. Let's get to the- I've already lived through my 20s. Yeah, I've lived through my yeah. 30s. I ain't got time for this. I ain't got time for this. Um, 20 or 30 like year olds have told me, mate. Not even TikTok or, or um, only, I oh, mean, only fans. We don't, we don't talk about that stuff here. Anyway, we just did. Um, so, 40, 40s and 50s. Well, what, what sort of, well, what consideration? 30s, 40s? 30s and 40s, right? You're becoming more financially stable. You, you're you starting to get more. Absolutely. Hopefully. You're starting to get more responsibilities, right? Like, we now have a pet dog, um, precursor to kids that you now have starting to have kids. Like, like things are starting to compound and add to the list of things that you have to think about. But um Oh, the yeah. responsibilities. Responsibilities. How do yes. we think about this for lending? So um I think when we're we're kind of looking at this age group, um, there can be two sides to it. So one is you've been having a really good run. Um, you're, you know. Mm. Like you've been saving, you've been investing. I'm seeing a lot more uh, clients uh, come to me with their um, contributions based on investment, successful investment, um, rather than just putting money in the bank, not financial advice, nothing like that. That's just not what I'm here for. But essentially, um, you've generally got a little more nous about you, a bit more experience, understanding of the world, Um maybe talking to your friends a little bit more. I think we're we're in an age now where there's a lot more information available at your fingertips. Like the bank's not sending you that uh, letter by snail mail anymore. They're sending it instantly (laughs) to your internet banking platform. So there's a whole lot more information that's available to you, which I think really arms the age group of 30s to 40s with a lot more information. And um, what I'm seeing is, savings professionals you know at the top of their game um digging in deep they they don't have the kids in private school yet so they've actually got the ability that their capacity is maybe a little more opened up um the other side is uh people who've potentially had some experiences in life that have changed their circumstances in a detriment so it's put them behind a little bit so i my my view of this age group is you're getting really different life experiences now you're getting people who've lived and and had certain things um go on and the the vehicle of how they move forward can be very different based on whatever those circumstances are like you know those that have kids we love kids I don't have any, but we love kids. Um, uh, but they, they're a liability when it comes to lending. You know, you can take a hundred grand off your borrowing capacity for having one dependent. So um, yeah, the I, other yeah, side let's, is. Let's just, let's just, um, I thought it was only 30 or 40 or 50K. Like what's this 100K number? Like what, what, what oh. is, is that depending <laughs> on what you're spending on them? Is that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, you put your kids through through private school. Um, you're looking at, you know, the assessment of those expenses are outside the standard living expense um, measure. So it's not necessarily um, just, you know, 50 grand. 50 grand could make or break what your lending opportunities are based on what your goals are. So just understanding that you have choices and um, I think if you if you prepare and you have conversations, you surround yourself with, you know, chat to your broker, say what your life plan is, talk to your accountant, tell them what you want to do with business, tell them that you want to get into property, be open. Um, that's kind of where I was alluding to before. There's more than just five C's. Communication is a huge part. That communication is not one of the five C's for credit worthiness, but communication um, between you and your partner. Uh, interestingly, I see, um, I have seen uh, and been in some pretty uncomfortable experiences where I'm talking to two applicants, a couple that are, uh, you know, looking at their finances. Obviously, that's why they've come to me. 
but then there's this undisclosed 50 grand worth of credit card debt that they've mm. gone and used to buy all sorts of toys and fun things and not told their partner about. Oh, wow. So, um, oh, so you just dig that up in front of them, just get the meeting, line them both up. Just wanted would... to uh, <laughs> just <laughs> raise this. And also, yeah. who do you raise it with? Which which partner do you? You don't know which one owns the debt, so it's like. <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the beauty is aside. you're right. So you can ease, you can keep information hidden, that's fine. But when it comes to lending, those things are out on the table. We see them on your credit file. You can't hide that kind of stuff. And um, the lender's going to see it. So you might not disclose it to your broker. Maybe they don't run a credit check before they submit your loan. But that bank's going to come back and say, hey, there's 20 grand worth of undisclosed liabilities here. What's that all about? Mm. So um, communication, I think, is really kind of important um, around that. How have this? How has this this kind of gone over the about? I don't know. During COVID, I think they got a little bit scared about um, uh, like undisclosed. Well, maybe not undisclosed, but it was like uh, the can't think of like debts. Like people were like, "Hey, what are you spending this money on?" The banks were coming at people and like, "What are you spending this money on? Why have you got afterpay? Why have you got this?" Like, is that happening as much now? Are you seeing that, or is there a shift away from that towards that? Do you see banks asking a lot more questions, or the how is scrutiny? it going? What, what I think you're talking about, Joe, is um, expense verification, where where people were sort uh, of that's what it was. Seeing things were being yeah. sort of scrutinised, and this is probably around the time of the Royal Commission, was it, Karina? It wasn't so much. Yeah. And then because banks were sort of like, oh, and there was the Wagyu beef case with Westpac where they sort of said, <laughs> where there was, where they, where they said that the, the, the lender said, I'm going to reduce my, I can reduce my living expense. So I can not buy that Shiraz or the, or the Wagyu beef because those are, those mm -hmm. are luxuries. I don't need those, yeah. but I choose to buy them yeah. if, if, if I got, if push came to shove. So that's kind of where there was all those sort of test cases, but yeah, sorry, Karina, go yeah. on. Yeah. Go on. I think um, I think the scrutiny is still there. So um, right. essentially, you you go buy a house, you go buy an investment property, you've got multi property portfolio, and you've got lending on all of them. And you know, there's a purpose for everyone and how it's been set up. But the bank owns it until you pay them back. So they're going to be really clear on making sure that you are a good candidate for them to invest in you because that's really what they're doing. So when you look at um, living expenses or, you know, the scrutiny that comes, they need, they have to do it. We have to abide by it. They also will look at things like, okay, you're a conservative spender. You're only spending as a single $1,600 a month because you're, you know, squirreling every dollar that you have away uh, but we can see that you um, have squared away 100 grand in savings it makes sense that you have been conservative in your spending however you earn a particular amount of money you live in a particular area um, lenders age. will still st still look at what the statistics are around around you so they're not going to say, oh, we'll assess you at two and a half percent, uh, sorry, two and a half thousand, uh, but you've said 1,600. It, it doesn't work like that. You've got to meet the criteria and the bank set the right. criteria. You just got to um, work out which vehicle works best for what your strategy is. There's a question that's come up here. I don't know if it's a joke, but uh, it's also good to answer. We love what jokes. Kind of for fun. What if you can't explain oh. $50,000 of cash? Do they still ask questions? So, yeah, we, we're talking about the negative side when money's coming out, but what about when money's coming in? Um, they want to know where it where it's come from. So what's so, the, but, Because that, yeah. that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pace of character because if, where are you getting this 50K from to just turn up off the back of a truck? Like, I mean, yeah, that's kind of like, yeah. are so you the, the type best, of person? The, yeah. <laughs> so the best um, way around it is to send the money to your mum and then get your mum to send it to you and then you say, well, mum <laughs> sends it to me, so that's fine. Well, not financial yeah. advice. Yeah. Definitely not. Yeah. I'm going to bring this There's thing also, up. There's also, you know, 
We just did a podcast. Well, no, that's just that's just yeah, that's kind of that's not financial yeah. advice. <laughs> Sorry, go on. We're not we're not have a a strategic conversation with a broker. We're just, I would say absolutely. You know? What do you need a strategic Jeez. mortgage broker? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think you know part of it is um, anti-money laundering and counterterrorism. Like yeah, banks yeah, want to know that that is legitimate funds coming. It's where um, equally when, you know, as investors, when we're accessing equity from our properties to, to leverage or, or recycle debt, um, we've got to declare what the purpose of the funds are. It's got to make sense. You want funds out for renos. You want funds out to invest in your share portfolio. Your accountant, you know, or financial advisor are giving you a letter to support that type of strategy. You're, you're getting equity out for um, the purpose you know, to be able to purchase two or three properties or one property, whatever it be, um, lenders are saying, all right, well, you might be going to um, lender ABC for that equity, uh, but we want to see that you service because you've told me, me the bank, uh, that you want that cash for this purpose. Well, I want to be able to now service you and demonstrate that you can actually qualify to purchase that property that you've told us. So not a lot of lenders will do that because, you know, we we can go to different and utilise and leverage off different lender policies based on strategy. Um, but it's also understanding there are some lenders that are quite conservative in that manner and they will want to know if it's going to work, if the story that you're telling them is going to work. So, yeah, mm. so basically what, what you're sort of saying is they're, they're going to control, they won't give you, they won't approve, formally approve the sort of, like, well, they'll formally approve it, but they won't sort of let you finalise that until they see a contract of sale for another property. And then they'll sort of say, okay, and look, that property you're buying there is 400K, you're going to have 320 against that. And and that and your interest, and they want to know the interest rate. So then they'll say, they'll then in sort some of factor cases, in their calculations. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Control yeah. the funds. Yeah. Um, they do it with Renault as well sometimes so so, sort of okay. so, so for 30 year olds and and 40 year olds you can kind of i guess you've they, got options you've got options you've still got yeah. time they're a little you've bit more time. financially stable they may yes. have some more they may have some more equity but then you've got the the other side of things where they're competing financial responsibilities right we've got kids we've got mortgages um we have a little bit less time um yeah okay so we've still got enough for got enough. lenders to still consider a 30 year loan term for you. Okay. Yeah. Now there drum was roll. actually a drum roll. Well, there was another there was a question that came up. Let's just let's talk about the 50s. Let's talk about the the big five zero, the half a century. Congratulations, guys, for making it this far. Um, this is a good year. These are this is this is prime time. This is the time to be. Um, so these people have been around the, been, been around the world a couple of times. Um, 50 feels like, well, maybe they haven't, you know, some, maybe they haven't been anywhere. Maybe they've not, no, well, I mean, the, 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 the world's, the world's spinning quite a few times for them. Um, okay. but, but, uh, how, how do we think about lending for this? Because we may have a little bit more equity. We may have a little bit of we, our kids. Actually, one of the things is kids, right? You we were talking about teens. Um, these kids are now over 18. They're now no, no longer a dependent. They're no liability for you. Your, your, your broking has opened up for you. The gates, the floodgates have opened. Yes. How do we think about this yeah. age? I think it's a pretty fun age because there, there's an opportunity that opens up in this age group because of the tenure that you've put in in your working years that you've got other opportunities that open. So maybe you've purchased your first home You've got equity in your property. You're utilizing that to, to for leverage. You've got super. You've got opportunities that go with self managed super funds and and lending in that space as well. And I think whilst um, there's a lot of responsibility and it's very uh, restricted um, with the CIS Act about what you can and can't do within um, self managed super funds, uh, I've been. Uh, I've experienced over the last couple of years more people in that space and utilising the the funds that they've essentially worked for um, as another vehicle to be able to invest uh, into and open up other opportunities. 
and you and you don't have that in your 20s 100 100 percent I like it. Yeah. Okay. It does okay. uh it does get a little harder in in the space of this is where we kind of step into that what's your exit strategy? The bank wants to know mm. how are you going to retire with no debt. <laughs> so this is where uh your strategy and and purpose behind why you're doing what you're doing starts to become more important and that communication to the lender of what your plan is and and realistically uh looking at that yourself and being realistic about it i think if you can start to consider how you want to retire where you want to retire um if you can consider those things in your 20s and 30s when you're in your accumulation stage of of funds i think it can aid you when you're getting into those older years and and if you're in your 50s and and you didn't think about those like when you're in your that in your 30s and 40s um understanding what your plan and strategy is at this age um and the decisions that you make and the impact that it makes and really ironing out what a reality is for you with an exit strategy so some lenders so will is- allow using super some lenders will allow you to downsize what if you're What if you don't have an owner-occupied home and you've got into the investing game or you're getting into the investing game? How are you planning to have those repaid by retirement or what's the strategy around it? And this is where I strongly believe, you know, when you're looking in this space, this is where you want to be a little more, um, uh, what's the phrase? not necessarily conservative, but more um, weighing up the the pros and cons a little more. You can't really take as many risks as what you may in your 20s. And I think this is where, you know, engaging like with you, Joe, where it's saying, well, why are you investing? Where are you investing? What are you, what's the plan behind it? What kind of like, are you looking for higher rental yields? Are you looking for capital growth? What, what infrastructure is going on in this area? Um, what's the purpose behind the investment? Because yeah. it's got to be purposeful based on, I mean, people are living up to a hundred. My grandmother just, she's turning 91 next month and she's fit as a fiddle, still living in her own house, doing her own thing. Um, so people may be retiring or looking to retire at 65 or 70, but they've still got, I mean, some people are still have another 20 or 30 years ahead of them. So it's kind of looking at what's that, what's that plan. So I highly recommend getting financial advice engaging really supporting and surrounding yourself with um with team with experts in their field who can support provide you the information for you to be able to make a a a great decision for what the next couple of years hold because when it comes to lending when it comes to the bank they want to know how you're going to pay it off in the next you know 15 20 years yeah, and can can, can well, we ask while, while we're talking about this? Because I think let's let, let's what what are some of the and I'm not saying that people should generically regurgitate these extra strategies to their to their broker because it really it needs to be consultative. You shouldn't just be willy nilly saying these things. But let, what what are what are typically the the things that that are seen as as valid exit strategies for for somebody in their 50s or 60s or even sort of late 40s? Because some 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 banks or some lenders do question at, at, at late forties. What are you? What, what are they sort of doing to pay? And particularly if somebody's in occupation as a builder in the late forties, like or something like that, or, or in a physical environment, like those people might not be able to work till sixty five or in that industry. That's, so what's yeah? You know, what are some of the yeah. extra strategies that you um, come across um, and mention for uh, simplicity's sake? When you buy an investment property, you could sell the investment property is is a, an easy one but what it more comes around is what they're wanting to understand is they don't want you to have um a debt on your on your PPR so if you're if you're someone who has an owner occupied home and you've still got a mortgage on it it's 
how will you have that debt repaid? Because that's not where you've got rental income that's coming in to help you pay it down necessarily. Um, this is where uh, sale works um, by 50s. You know, this is kind of where we're sitting that 50 to 60s. Your your kids, they're graduated, they're 18, you're living in a five-bedroom house. Do you need a five-bedroom house anymore? You know, so downsizes. Down, down downsize it's got to make sense though because they lenders will also look at all right well if you live in an eight if you've got an eight hundred thousand dollar property and you've got a six hundred thousand dollar mortgage and you sell it plus your sale your proceeds and everything that goes along with it can you buy something for 150 160 grand not really so it's really understanding um when you're looking at uh, what I've seen as a as a transition over the years is for anyone who's using a um, a downsize sale and downsize as part of their strategy is demonstrate where you would actually be downsizing to show what properties are in the market in that range in that area um, and have it make sense. So one of the things we can't. Pre- you know, lenders aren't looking at what that's going to be, property is going to be worth in 10 years time. So they're not looking at other property cycles. They're looking at what it is right now. So the story, if you had to do it right now, do you have enough super to utilize a super lump sum payment? Can you downsize? Will that assist? Lenders will look at um, amateurization of uh, superannuation as well. So utilizing super to downsize is also another option um gotta have it make sense so what what i'm sort of hearing here is it's it's all about sort of removing all the reasons the lender to say no because they're going to think oh you know this person's 55 they want a 30-year loan term how how are they paying this off and then if you don't have if you say well i'm going to pay it off well that's not really a great reason like what is the what is the narrative how can you support what you're saying that's right. And especially if you're in a, um, a laborous job, like you mentioned, a builder, a brickie, um, they're not necessarily going to be wanting to work as, they are, as they're getting a bit older or not have the ability to do what they were doing before. So have your loan terms make sense as well. Love it. Well, I'm kind of um, interested in maybe exploring like, one side of someone that's done really well in their fifties and own property. And what are some of the strategies and things that we should think about for them? And then also someone that hasn't done as well, that doesn't own any properties. How should we think and and how do those things change? Um, Before we do that, we just need to run this little sucker. Our own bills. There's nothing worse than going into a situation unprepared, especially when that situation is purchasing one of the most expensive assets of your life against a trained property expert in the form of a real estate agent. It's a scary thought, but it is a skill that can be taught. Do you want to learn how to become fully prepared when buying a property so you can get out there, buy your dream home or investment property without the fear of actually messing it up? Scott Agate, the founder and expert property negotiator at Hello House has been helping people buy their properties by stepping in and negotiating with the agents and saving his clients tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars. Scott has now decided to share all that he's learned over the past 28 years in real estate so you can go out there and do the exact same thing on how to find a property, analyze that property, negotiate on that property and transact on it to get the best results. He's created the Get Buyer Ready course, which is a step-by-step guide on how you too can become an expert property negotiator. It's the easy way of how you can avoid all of these agent games and get the best purchase price on that dream home or your investment property. The course is in short buys for busy people with no fluff at all. Just all the information you need to get buyer ready and secure that next property with confidence at the best price. Scott has been kind enough to give our community a massive discount with the link below. Sign up today before you even think about putting an offer on that next property and it will be one of the best decisions you ever make. We're back. We we are back. We're back. So which um which example do you want to tackle first, Joe? Do you want to tackle somebody who's been successful property or do you want to somebody who 
Let's, let's go with that. someone who's successful. Oh, sorry, let's go with someone who's successful, right? Let's say someone has a boatload of equity. Um, what are some of the challenges that they're going to be facing? Because I bought my PPOR, you know, I, you know, the classic boomer story that the uh, the internet loves to spread. Oh, I only paid a hundred thousand dollars for my house. Now it's worth three million, and uh, all the gen whatever generation we're up to now is complaining because it didn't and cost that much to buy that property. But XYZ um, plus plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what are some of the challenges? Let's say we bought our property. Um, we've got a lot of equity in it. What What are some of the things we should be thinking about doing or how should we be thinking about lending them from that front? I think uh, like cash is king when you're borrowing. So having equity, having the deposits, having something there, that's a great benefit to you. Um I've got some interesting, you know, you work with hundreds of clients over the years. Um, but what I see for someone who's older, bought some time ago, has that equity built up, um, is looking at where they're buying, what the purpose is behind it, where they're they're putting the funds, how they're going to pay it off. So it still comes back to that. Um, what's the what's the plan around it? So whether using it to help build business, if you're building business, whether you're using it to help build investment portfolio, um, you have some options that that sit around there. So are you wanting to know a bit more about what are the challenges that they face? Yeah, what are some of the challenges? Like what? What are the big things that you constantly see? Oh, I see people not wanting to repay debt, getting on the uh, interest-only interest bandwagon. Mm. And uh, relying on market increase. So if we look at cash is king for borrowing, the, the, when you've got income, when you've got um, deposits. This enables you to kind of step forward and move out, and it gives you options. Um, I I do see, you know, investment, interest only, P and I. There's different strategies, pros and cons for both of them. But when you are in an accumulation stage and understanding how the impact of those decisions are, will have on your borrowing, so going at five years interest only. That's that's great, you know. What you're, what the lender's actually looking at for those type of um, those structures is you've only got if if you're blessed to get a thirty year loan term, you've got only twenty five years to to pay it back, which actually does decrease your borrowing capacity service servicing wise. So, I think that's a challenge getting people's mindset um, switched from. Oh, it's investment, so it has to be interest only. I look at it to say it's investment. What is the purpose and what do you want to achieve long term? If we're looking at this one transaction and this is all you want to do, then maybe that's a great, um, uh, you know, a great structure for you. But do you want to get another one? You've got access to equity. This is a wonderful thing about having a PPR um, that you paid so little for and you've been working really hard to pay it down. Um is actually uh, an, another thing is having 100 or 200 grand sitting in your offset or redraw that you've put aside and it, it's, you know, working for you because it's reducing the interest on your owner-occupied loan. But um, recognising that how you can actually utilise those funds and recycle it in a way that can actually leverage you into getting property, I think, mm. um often in an older generation or where they've seen a, had a lot more experience, life experience, or they've come um, from a time where they saw their parents really struggle. So they want to hold, you know, you want to hold on to things. Um, getting through those psycho like the psychological barriers around money um, can, yeah, can be a, a, a struggle. Sometimes it's like the incidental counsellor is what you are as a mortgage broker. <laughs> the counsellor hat on. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so so okay, let's, well, let's just say, can, can we, can we, I, I want to put some parameters around and we're not, we're not using, we're not saying that anybody, if, if this is somebody's circumstance, we're not saying that, that you should go and do this, um, what, we, what we're now about to talk not. about. But anyway, yeah. so I just cave it, I'll just not cave it, I'll just disclaim the, the heck, of, heck away out of this. Um, but so let's just say I'm 50, I've got four properties, I've, I've sort of got an average sort of income. So let's just say a couple household income of so between 120, 150. So I've just sort of thrown some some sort of numbers out there. So four properties and and so what are sort of some of the challenges? Because we, we talked about this before. You um you sort of have have helped some people in this sort of situations. What what challenges is that kind of person in that situation facing? Because they've, they've probably done pretty well with their investing at four properties, or let's just say four or five or six, one somewhere in that vicinity. What are the challenges that person faces or will be facing if they want to go and buy more? So, um, what is the, how is the, how is that portfolio or how is that property working for you? Is it working for you? So what's the purpose behind it? Um, do you have it because it's a cash cow and it's, uh, it's bringing in those dollars, it's paying off the mortgage. Um, is it in an area that it's had the growth? factor have you Mm. it's maybe the rental hasn't changed too much but it's you've had it for maybe one or two property cycles and you've made some good coin on it so when you're looking at that kind of optimization of your lending and um, your portfolio and wanting to take the next step a challenge can be set being set in your own ways and holding on for things that may not be serving you and I think, you know, if you have an open mind about what the purpose is behind it and what options you can have from that. So what I have seen is we love we love the phrase of debt recycling. So um, using uh, either paying something off or using debt in a way from a different way that you've currently been using it to better your situation. So... Someone who may have four or five or six properties, um, if they've not been serving you in the original purpose of why you got it, why not review whether you still need them? So I've got um, a client that's actually uh, sold quite a number of their properties and they're changing their trajectory um, on on what they're doing, buying in different uh, entity vehicles Mm-hmm. Yeah, hope that makes. Yeah, sense. I answered so that, that. Yeah, it <laughs> does. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, because I think some of some of the challenges that that person will face is they'll they'll have sort of if they've got a four or five property portfolio, let's just assume they've got a couple over one or two in WA. Maybe they've bought some over there recently. They've got a got a couple in sort of over east or east coast, and so they've probably got sort of four million dollars of the portfolio worth, or maybe let's just say three million, whatever it is, three or four million. And they've probably got uh, a debt position of, I don't know, 1.5 or 2 million. So they've got well in excess of maybe sort of close to $2 million in, we may not usable equity. So let's just say 1.5 million of usable equity. But they won't they won't be able to, to probably, a lender will say, well, look, you've got all this equity, but great, you don't have the income to service it. And that's kind of, that's where we sort of, you, you unpack those points. You sort of said, well, what is, that's probably, you've got a more of a growth portfolio rather than a cash flow. So it's then, about yeah. making having those discussions with your broker like yourself, um, with your accountant, with maybe your financial planner, depending on um, yeah, is that is that kind of the conversation you have with, yeah. with how to move forward and buy the next one? Definitely, because if you have if you continue doing the same thing that you're doing, that's kind of the definition of like insanity, right? Or it's madness. Doing the same it's thing same. over in, and that's exactly right. Results. If it's, I hate that quote. Like. Yeah, but but it but it but it's grounded here in the sense that if you're expecting a different outcome, something has to change. So, um, having an open mind to actually understand that there are alternative options, and I think that can come a lot with experience. You know, we're heavily influenced by media. So another thought is, you know, ten properties in ten years. 
was when it's I gotta first be 10 started. Properties in ten minutes. What about ten years? Ten properties you know? in ten, 10 minutes, right? Gone. But so that was really um, when I first started broking. That was a, a conversation that I feel like I heard clients say to me all the time. I want to get ten properties in ten years, and it was the same thing repeated to me. No one said anything different other than ten properties in ten years. I think when you when you shift your mindset and go, do I need ten properties? What do I need? You know, the really awesome thing about having a chat with a financial advisor is they actually bring you into the, like into the future, far into the future and say, well, what do you want to retire on? What is a, what is ideal for you? You know, do you want to go on holidays? Um, do you want to be able to just comfortably have your standard expenses covered, um, making sure your mortgage is paid off and those type of things? And then they bring it back and you might actually recognize that you might not need as much as what you thought you did and that's I guess the benefit of engaging and I really encourage um, my clients to engage with a financial advisor um, at any stage of their their journey if they haven't spoken to somebody because you got to plan for it you got to plan for you know forget about mortgages for one side you know, as a broker, we've got a duty of care. I'm going to get you into the biggest debt of your life with a smile type thing, right? But it's really important that you are protected. So that's the thing. We can plan for retirement. We can plan for these grand portfolios that are going to be um, setting us up. But what if something happened to you? And it's not if you kicked the bucket. It's really what if you were incapacitated in in some point? Like how would you be able to continue doing what you want to do? And I think um, I'm the optimist in life and conservative with numbers. Um, and I say that to my clients all the time. But I think if you can be prepared, if you can understand, make sure you've got the right protections in place, um, you, can, you can take what life comes, you know, uh, a little easier, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, take it easy. Kick take back, it easy. Relax. Kick back. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of cautious of time, so let's chat to sure. the 60s. What are our 60s. thoughts on the age of 60s? Have we missed the boat? Should we not be buying property at all? Um, can we still lend at 60s? The banks actually entertain the idea like what is this is 60 the new 40 what is 60s to you from a lending perspective this may not be every broker's experience but mine is a very small percentage of my clients are based around over 60. i have served uh clients over 60 but they're usually you know unencumbered owner occupied property uh, they are now looking at what they're um, and and doing some investments. Um, generally, uh, what I have seen is it's purposeful based more around family than it is about accumulation of funds for their personal situation. So they're looking to see what extra can I do to set my family up? Uh, absolutely exit strategy has to be super strong uh, at that age. Yeah, it's not not, not, it's not. not too much. Yeah, not too much around there, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that's so I think, the challenge. I think, I think we, have to, we have to go back a little bit in time. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but we have to go to the scenario where well, what should somebody, if somebody's 50 now and they haven't haven't had a property well, yet, what? Okay, sorry, you go, well, let's go, let's go to this one, right? Um, hi all, at age 50 female, single, no property, but a good income, growing deposit. In your opinion, do I have enough time to buy an investment property for capital growth that will allow me to leverage into my own property by early 60s or should I buy a PPOR and smash the loan? No, it's not financial advice, but just interested in your thoughts. So single female, no property, but a good income and a growing deposit. Good, what are your good, thoughts good on, on that? I think that might be the... I think that might be the person who just said we didn't talk about. 50 yeah, well, thank you for being so them. open, and yeah, thanks for being so open and putting that putting that down um, because it helps yeah. a lot of people. Um, Absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? I would be interested to know what your thoughts are around this. So I might deflect for a moment here. You know, mm. 
I've to, definitely got to an opinion, you, Joe. Joe probably has one too. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, just around uh, property cycles. So for for me for a, as a broker, it's a numbers game. So what are you earning? What's your deposit? What are you buying? What are we expecting that property to have in a capital growth? Because if it has um, the ability to, you know, um, have a bit of a snowball um, with some accumulation of equity that we can leverage off. Um, that's that's great. But what kind of property cycle are we looking at? So this is where um, I have seen people do this. They're usually looking and at um, engaging with an agent because it's really based on driving a, a type agent. of property. A buyer's not, agent. Not like, right. selling agent. I mean, geez, so, so. No, no, no. A buyer's <laughs> agent like Joe um, or whomever. Uh, but it really is what what are you going to get out of that property? What what guts does it have to get you there? And what are you yeah. looking to get on the end of it? Yeah, yeah exactly. The answer is yeah. what do you want? Like for me, it's age 50 is not mm. not too old. If we, if we can get Absolutely. access, if we have... Well, hang on, just go back to this one, Jeff. Um, yeah. At age 50, if you have a good income and you can borrow and you have a good deposit, um, you can buy an investment property for capital growth if you – there are ways to add value to properties, right? Like, yes. like uh, you know, a fine example is renovation projects. Like we, we bought a property – Last year for four hundred and fifty three thousand, it's now worth five hundred and forty thousand. So it's grown a hundred thousand dollars because we spent twenty grand on a renovation, yeah. um, and bought in a good pocket. So ten years is a long time. Five years is a long time, but it does depend on on how much work you're looking to put in to be able to do that. For me, it's you might want to take a few more, like do a little bit more value adding, or you know. Renovations, yeah. subdivisions, developments, those type of things, and and align yourself with people that are willing to help you with that because that's going to guarantee. Depending on somebody's growth. risk tolerance, though, I, I will I will yes. put that out there because yeah, there is definitely. more risk in, in that sort of strategy because it can. Well, be there, is, more and, there is. Also, it's. I don't think you can be as passive in the investment when you're in your fifties, when you're when you're in your twenty to thirties because yeah, I've seen it multiple times people made a decision and and they yeah. go oh it didn't really work out for me that property and I and I <laughs> sold it or um oh I bought this brilliant property uh I sold it I made a hundred grand on it uh but if I sold <laughs> it now I would have made eight hundred thousand dollars on it yeah. so um but the decision of when they bought it what type of property what the purpose was behind it it was a little bit I want to get my foot in the door with something. I've got time yeah. for it to 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 work in either way for me, but I've got time to be able to um, mitigate a, a risk in a different way later. So when you're in your 50s, you've still got 20 to 30 years that a lender will accept on an exit strategy for you. You can still get a 30-year loan term depending on overall circumstance and assessment. But I've got a lot of clients that are, you know, 45, 50 that are starting their investment journey now. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Jeff? How, how, how would you answer this question? I'd say I'd say we're living till 70 and 80. So if you think about that, that that's at least 30 years if you live to 80, assuming that. I mean, look, you never, yeah. um, you know, tomorrow is not promised, of course. So, but yeah, nobody's tomorrow is promised. So the way I would think yeah. about that is, I think as long as you're comfortable knowing that you can't control what the property market does. Like if, if you go and buy a property in, let, let's just say, Southeast Queensland tomorrow at that sort of, at an average sort of price there, five or 600,000 and, and it sort of, and, and it does on average 5% for the next 10 years, then what's that? So it'll grow 50% and, and it'll go to from 500K to, to seven, $750,000. Uh, $750, so it'll go up by 50%. Let's just, let's just say it does that. And, and what, what, is, what does that mean for, for this person or whoever it is, is financial situation? Does that, like, so, so actually sort of playing out and sort of saying scenario, I mean, you can't, you're not going to know what it'll do. But then, and then sort of saying, okay, if it, does, if it doubles in, in 10 years, and it goes to a million dollars. What does that mean for my fund? Or if it, let's just say you, you unfortunately you don't use a VA or, 
or you sort of, I mean, you use a BA and they don't sort of knock it out of the park or you, or you do it yourself and, and, and you get 30% in 10 years and, you, and it's now worth, what, sort of 620, not 680,000. What does that mean for you? So just sort of uh, mapping out all those things and saying, well, what, what does that mean for me and what, what, do, what do I actually want to do with my life? And, and it's, I even yeah. struggle to do that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, and, that's and also to consider that. if it's a consideration as well as if you're going to be buying a PPOR that like that was one of the options that is also going to grow. It, it it's also going to go up Hopefully. in value. So yeah, you, you know you've got um, to think if it's investment like that's the challenge is you know if you want to live in an area that's not an investment grade suburb, um, it may not grow as much as going to an investment grade area. So it's kind of like think about that as well because yes it. it you're buying a PPR, it may grow and it may do it. But if you're well outside of an area that really stacks up, it's a place that you love, but it hasn't got the infrastructure and all the spend, then maybe it might be worth investing. So it is a big yeah. balance of trying to understand. Um, it can also look at or consider um, can can it be a purchase? Now, this is a, <laughs> I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for saying this because the emotional investor is a hard one to get through the, the psyche of, uh, the one that wants to touch it and feel it and drive past it every day. Um, but what about an investment that you're happy living, working where you are, you're in the hustle bustle, um, but you've bought a property in, in Harvey Bay, I don't know what happens in Harvey Bay rental-wise, but you buy a property as an investment now because your plan in the next 20 years is that's where you're going to retire. So you're putting funds away, you're going to do renos on it long, like later, but it's actually an emotional investment, but it's purposeful based on, you know, if, if it's only one property, there's other ways to look at the type of property that you're that you're buying um, and you've definitely got time. I think the best thing about the question that was asked is that the question was asked. I think the second best thing is talking to a strategic mortgage broker, talking to someone who's going to look at what your strategy is and brainstorm some of your options and get you thinking a little bit more about what do you really want out of that and would you be happy to settle for something that didn't grow in the idea that that is planned? Would that still, you know, kick your goal when you're getting to retirement? Mm. Yeah, good. well said. Um, okay, cool. Let's crack on to some of these other questions. Um, there's another one here that says, any tips for someone who has felt stuck, 45-year-old with one investment property worth 385 dollars 240 can I look at investment number two or have I missed the boat? The the, the key Ooh, question that we've been that. asking all day. 45, yeah. one investment property, um, hundred and odd thousand of, of equity. Um, what do you reckon? Have you done your numbers to see what you can do to leverage off the equity that you have for a second one? There are all sorts of strategies out there. And look, I'm no um, uh, personal opinion. I don't uh, I don't push any. Everything is based on what a client's own uh, purpose is. But I've I got a client. Yeah. I've got a client that um that I mean, his is like sub 200 k properties earning like you know 10 percent rental yields. That there's no capital growth in those properties, but they're little cash cows for him. So there are so many options out there that I think it's about understanding what you can do. Like I would rather be able to have a look at someone's numbers and say, okay, well, maybe this property isn't working for you. If you if you sold it, if we started again, we recycled it. What? what could you do? Go have a chat with Joe or, okay, great. This one is doing okay. You've got, you know, a hundred grand that we can access. This is the maximum for the next property um, that you can mm -hmm. go to. And, and you, you just got to talk to someone, you know, if you've, if you've got the question of have I missed the boat, just have a chat with a broker, have a chat with someone who can yeah. do your numbers and who's not just going to look at this to say, um, okay, can I just get this person in 
to a property and and can I get an awesome commission from a BA, um, you know, for a referral fee or something like that. But someone who actually is understanding why you want it, like why do you want the next one? What's the goal for the next one? I I think that's absolutely important because being a being a broker formally and and it was it was very easy to get to be honest it was very because it it is to some extent a numbers game as in you need to sort of keep sort of putting loans through the thing to be able to keep keep putting food on the table so at the same time if if you're not comfortable with with a broker you've chatted to or if you haven't chatted one yet becky or anyone um chat to the next one and then sort of until you actually i mean not probably not go around to 20 brokers because then they, they, their time is valuable as well. But if you've chatted to one and and the vibe's just not quite there, it just feels like they're looking to push you into a loan so they can so they can sort of earn their next commission check. Then maybe go and chat to another one, like like a Karina or an Aaron or this. We've had a couple of good, really great brokers on the show as well, and just sort of understand well and ask that question: How have you helped somebody in a similar situation to me? And what what have, what has it been the outcome? And that's you're not gonna. There's no foolproof way that that person is going to yeah. guarantee that that'll mean that you'll get a good service. But hopefully, then you'll get sort of better than what you might have gotten. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I, I do yeah. believe. No, solid. Yeah, I do believe in yourself. um. Yeah, yeah, and and different brokerages, you know, niche in different areas. So I think that's a really good point that you made there, Jeff. Is asking the question like. Not necessarily, um, hey, broker, what have you done personally for your own situation? Because that mm-hmm. then you're limited by one person's experience. It's what kind of clients have you helped that are like me? Because then you're you're opening up a whole wealth of knowledge and experience that comes from that broker. Also asking your broker, what do you specialize in? So, you know, you mentioned um, in my bio, like I love first home buyers, I love first time property buyers, but my passion for them is based on getting their foot in the door and the journey that's ahead of them. But I also love the seasoned um, investor who's looking to to leverage. I love the the person who's build up business and use business to accumulate their deposits for them to then go and invest as well. And I think not every person you speak to is going to be your cup of tea. You might reach out to me and you might go, oh, you know, she was she was great on the on the live, but you know, when I've spoken to her directly, I just don't get get the vibe. The benefit think, that you it, have is there's a lot of us around. And I think you've just got to chat with someone, ask them what their experience is, understand um that every you know, I've got brokers in my network that all they do is look after mum and dad refinances. And that that's it. They don't want to do the investor. They don't want to work with the developer. They just want to look yeah. after after that person. Point. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. You got to focus on what they what are the type what is your everyday deal? How how would we ask that? What's the question that we need to ask them? Is it like what are your your normal type of person or like what is the normal client that you work with? Do you focus more on investors? Like what should yeah, we ask? What do you specialize find? in? Um yeah. uh what I liked the question Jeff asked is, you know, what other clients like me have you worked with or yeah. where do you really like or what's your experience? Because ultimately um, if you're later in your years getting into the investing cycle, I think you really want to have a team around you that is experienced um, that can provide the support and I think I wouldn't have the experience in the time that I've been broken if I didn't have, if I didn't deal with the hundreds of clients that I've dealt with. So maybe that's another thing is how long has your broker been in the game? Uh, I've been in the game 10 years, but I've got a business partner who's been in it longer. I've got other people. So the overall business experience has over, you know, 50 years of experience across the team so maybe these are other things that is are you working with a one-man band like I was a one-man band too one woman band my business partner was a one-man band um but I think there's also an added benefit when you have 
team around you that it's an accumulation of experience and that's kind of what I would rather have the support around me uh, than someone who who doesn't have a lot. But we all have to start somewhere. I didn't start with yeah. investors when I first started yeah. broking. It's t- it's tough to start yeah. investors because they're, they're a bit finicky. Um, let's um, I reckon we should probably finish off on yeah. this question. I mean, it's heaps of well, unless somebody asks. It's a great types yeah, it's really a amazing. great it's a great question. What strategies have you seen best perform to avoid maxing out serviceability? i.e. high capital growth, cash cows, or high rental yields, um, or a combination of both, like granny flats in good pockets. What have Thanks. you seen? I'll, what are you seeing on those you. deals that are that are working? Oh. This is the golden, <laughs> the golden, um, um, golden nugget. Can I golden say uh, it is a diverse portfolio? where all your eggs are in one type of basket. Mm, diversity. Yeah. Right. So, you know, dual lock type of properties have the great ability that, you know, if one's vacant, the other one's still got income coming in. So that can give you peace of mind in that space. Um, you know, a higher uh, rental yield, that's going to also give you a little bit of uh, cash that's maintained. Um buying off the plan brand new properties in uh you know you've also got the benefit that comes with time so you might put a deposit down now just as a caveat to anything off the plan is you're buying in and settling in potentially different markets so understanding all the risks that are associated with them I think that's really important when you're considering that type of property but I've got some clients who are um a little older um who've uh who've bought off the plan and you know they've already got a hundred grand growth in in that and it hasn't been um a year off the plan so, scam. I, I must admit I, and, and let's, let's not get joe started off the plans because what what could they have done in, in an exist in an existing property though karina what could they have done 200k in an existing property but anyway we're we won't go yeah, down that rabbit. Yeah, it, it really is where I think the diversity comes in because, it, it, you know, it's the same thing. You go, oh, this area is brilliant. Like I love Southeast Queensland or something as an example, but I'm going to buy all of my properties in Southeast Queensland. But then you're seeing, you know, the that that might be slowing down for an example. I'm not a expert here, you guys are. But you might see that area that you put all your eggs in one basket slow down and then now you're seeing like a peak happening in, in SA or WA. So from for me, what I saw in, in my um, broking journey has been, yeah, a lot of people hit the Queensland market and now the market is somewhere else. So understanding that, um, every state has different property cycles that you can't just bank on. They're all going to perform in the same way. I think diversity comes into it. I, I'm the conservative in life, you know, or optimist, but conservative with the numbers. I think why hedge your bets on on one type of strategy? I haven't seen it work for any one particularly. I see the ones that have success yeah. have a diverse have diversification. Yeah, because when you're thinking about strategy, you need to think about how it affects the overall. You need to understand what your portfolio is and what your portfolio is going to be and how they can each benefit it. Because yeah. like if you yeah. are getting it's a capital balance. growth play, you're going to need some cash flow to allow you to continue borrowing. Correct. So all of a sudden you've got this high cash flow one, sorry, high capital growth one. And it's draining the bank account. So great. Let's start looking at cash flow. Let's start thinking about commercial. Let's talking about granny flats. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden that extra income allows you more serviceability to be able to go again. So I yeah. think you're hundred percent spot on. I think those types of strategies where you can get your capital growth and you can have your cash flow as well. It, it keeps you in the game. I mean, one of the biggest things that I see is people leaving property. Um, not that I'm seeing, I haven't seen too much of it, but the ones that I see, are leaving Victoria, because they mate. can't afford Everybody's the cash selling. Flow. Haven't you heard, Joe? Everybody in Victoria <laughs> is selling their investment property. If you're I don't know. I, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing properties that were worth, you know, nine hundred to a million dollars that are now at seven hundred thousand dollars. Do you think those nine hundred thousand dollar properties are going to remain at seven hundred thousand dollars? 
I don't know. It's expensive to hold. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know. I see opportunity in different different things. Um, I love that. Yeah, you've got to, but that's not that's not the perfect strategy for everyone, is it? Because it's so negative cash flow, you can't afford to be able to hold mm-hmm. it. So you, you have to be playing in other markets that give you that cash flow. I was literally and, just and looking even, at even a other asset classes. I mean, let's let's not. I mean, I'm not saying people should, but Gurav love, loves loves these good old shares and ETFs. So no, I mean, I think yeah. I think it's yeah, it's important to consider well, what works for you and your situation. Yeah, I was just looking at um, Christopher uh, Louis Christopher's rental forecast he's saying perth is going to have 12 to 15 percent rental increases brisbane seven to ten rental increases darwin zero to three um melbourne six to nine percent so maybe we're going to get a little bit more from from uh, melbourne uh sydney seven to ten percent uh adelaide four to seven hobart negative two to negative five and then negative two to negative five for uh Canberra. So interesting times ahead in the property market. If somebody knows but, um, Louis Christopher, then please oh, tell him to answer his LinkedIn messages. <laughs> yeah. Someone, if anyone could get us Louis Christopher on the show, we really want him. We, we can't um, get an economist. Like we literally, like we can get everybody yeah, else. Yeah, what have we done? Or just to everybody message him on LinkedIn. Everybody, everyone who's no, on no, 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 please don't do that. <laughs> yes, please. No, please. So, Tag I him think... everything. Say, yeah. Louis, we need you. We haven't had yeah. the economist, and you're the first one, and we've messaged you hundreds of times, and it's getting pathetic. <laughs> no, back to okay, Karina. Well, you haven't so... seen my you haven't you haven't no. seen my inbox then, Karina. <laughs> this has been yes. this has been unreal. The problem is that I see out there is people like the first mortgage broker. I walked into like um, a Rams home loans or something. Like I walked into this one, and the guy's me, like, "You, me too, me too. you need." He was a nice uh, bloke. House. He was a nice bloke, but all he did was do, you know, basic. He didn't know anything about investing. He didn't know anything about strategy. We First need a strategic life. mortgage broker. How do we learn more about Karina and um, what you guys are all up to? Just Google a strategic mortgage broker. So you can you can reach us um, if you want to connect uh, strategicmortgagebrokers.com.au. We did our brand name change because we told clients every day of the week, we are your strategic mortgage broker. It's what we live. It's what we breathe. Um, jump on the website. You can do a free assessment, book in, have a chat. We may or may not be for you, but I really believe that the best thing for you to do is to have a chat. Yeah, I think um, communication is the most uh, a very important thing to be able to understand and communicate with the, the team that you build. Yes. Like yeah. if you, we're going to be talking, just letting you know, we're going to be talking about a half a million dollar asset here or 700,000 or a million dollars. It's going to get emotional and you're going to want to feel comfortable to be able to have that conversation with those people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I hey, 100% agree with know, that. You know, you are, you might even be lucky enough to talk to me. So, or you you might get Aaron, my business partner. He's pretty cool too. So, uh, you uh, could get for, either of us. Ask for Karina. Ask for Karina. Um, no, I... I um, I, I use a, I actually use Karina and Aaron for the mortgage broking for whenever people say I don't get any commission, I don't get any kickbacks. I use the best people, so I always use you guys because uh, you guys get to get some amazing results for our clients. So I'm I'm happy to say that. Um, but uh, cool. Well, let's do it, Karina. You have an amazing evening. Thank you very much. Is there anything you want to leave the audience with? Maybe a, a quote from Marcus Aurelius from your <laughs> no. Uh, no, look, just just surround yourself. Um, I think your vibe attracts your tribe, right? That's the the go-to phrase for the kids these days. But it, it really is talk to people, communicate, have a chat. If you're in doubt, just reach out and, and talk to someone. Talk to yeah, a professional, right. preferably. And, and don't get too angry for us tagging at everyone once a week, people. It's okay. If you, if you don't <laughs> like it, just ignore the notification you get on your phone. It's okay. Uh-huh. Or just there tune in and you might have a fun time. Oh, yeah, it is. I, I, I love this session. Like, thanks, thanks for coming on and sharing, I suppose, a topic there. Some people feel a bit uncomfortable um, about oh. sort of thinking, oh, you know, have I, have I missed out the FOMO? And it's like, and asking that question, it's like, I haven't started. I don't know where I'm going. And I'm afraid I don't know, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know yeah. how I'm going to. You'll, you'll be surprised how many opportunities and options there are out there. But it's like, you and know, you, people... you're not going to meet the woman or the man in your dreams if you don't get off the couch and leave your house. So Tinder. start the conversation the way, with yeah, someone. Yeah, I don't know about what I'm going to use these days, but yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I'm talking rubbish. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Hi, guys. Let's go buy a property. Catch you later.